Bernie, Murray and Nelson knew it was going to be a tough development year with the new BMW turbo engine, though I doubt any of them thought it would involve them reverting to their old Ford engines for a while and annoying their new German partners in the process. Things picked up later in the season, but reliability was still a major Achilles heel. The odd moment of frustration, as at Hockenheim aside, PK seems to have generally taken the whole thing in good part, while Petrezzi can look back with satisfaction on finishing a point ahead of his teammate and generally giving as good as he got, even if his maiden win in Monaco was more than a little fortunate. Gordon Murray has nearly finished work on 1983's car, and the team will be looking to build on this year's progress to get back to the top next year. Not too shabby overall for a team who ran most of the season with no sponsorship and little in the way of resources. The 011 is a decent chassis, but the real secret to their performance has been Michele Alboreto, who brought the car home in the points seven times and one place off in seventh on another three occasions. Compared to that, teammates Borgood and Henton can only be classed as disappointing. Uncle Ken will be hoping to hang on to his Italian star in the making over the winter, though he has been talked about for a Ferrari seat, an offer he would find it very difficult to refuse. At the end of 1981 season, it was becoming apparent that Williams's competitors were catching up, and this was proved true during 1982. Nonetheless, the team scored well on reliability and often scored points simply by keeping going while the turbos fell by the wayside. They remain top of the non-turbo heap, but that heap is getting smaller. Keke Rosberg is a hard-charging driver which occasionally caused problems with tyre wear, but he drove well across the season to take the title on dogged determination. Derek Daly was underwhelming in the second Williams, usually found mixing it in the midfield and occasionally picking up a point or two. Whether the car didn't suit his driving style or some other factor, it won't have done his chances of another top drive much good. For a team supposedly treading water while easing louder back into racing and awaiting a turbo deal, 1982 didn't go too badly at all for McLaren. Second in the championship with four wins, more than any other team except Renault, was the team's best showing since 1977 with James Hunt in the cockpit. The carbon fibre MP4B is still technologically streets ahead of most of its competitors, while reliability is there too, with the team scoring points at every race bar three. As for the drivers, both seem evenly matched, and long-time fans reckon this has been Watty's best season ever. He's made a name for himself for carving up through the field, the burn from the stern, as some people call it, though maybe if he qualified higher he wouldn't have to do it as often. Lauder looked like he'd never been away, winning on his third time out at Long Beach and showed the racecraft you would expect from a double world champion with his experience. The West Germans started decently enough, with two points finishes in the first four races, but they suffered from mid-season onwards with the loss of their Avon tyre supply and the enforced switch to Michelins, which didn't suit the D5 as well, and also as other teams introduced new cars while they persisted with their 1981 model. Manfred Winkelhock looks like he might be quite a find, usually qualifying well before being let down by his machinery, but both he and Salazar have had more than their share of red mist moments too. We'll see how the team go into 1983, which could be an interesting year for them, if the rumours of Winkelhock getting them a BMW engine deal turn out to be true. Better than 1981, but still slow progress. The team will be scratching their heads to know what went right in Austria that was missing for the rest of the year. The carbon fibre Lotus 91 gave Mansell a podium on its first outing in Brazil, post-disqualifications anyway, but it was a finicky beast and Nigel's scruff-of-the-neck driving style meant that he either broke the car or threw it off too often. Elio's finer touch helped him score reliably with seven points finishes in the 15 races he entered. Notably, De Angelis scored every time he finished a race. For 1983, Colin Chapman has arranged Renault Power and is said to be working on an innovative suspension system, so the team hopes for better next year, but there are some rumours coming out of the team that Nigel and Elio aren't getting on, and that Nigel has fallen out with team manager Peter Waugh. The Ensign team had essentially the opposite experience to ATS, with their enforced move away from Avon tyres actually benefiting them and leading Guerrero to qualify his car in the top 20 on a regular basis. Roberto was highly touted as a future star before the season, and while he didn't get much chance to show it in races, his qualifying form was pretty good. Unfortunately, the Ensign team are also in deep financial trouble, and it told in performances as the cars got more and more worn out with few spares to go around, culminating with having to pull out of the Caesars Palace race entirely after having no engine. Just making it to the start of 1983 will be an achievement for Monon's hard-trying team. 
Early evidence that the 1982 season would be a Renault walkover looked promising for Renault, worrying for everyone else, as the two yellow and white cars put on quite a demonstration in Kyle Army. The subsequent run of appalling reliability saw them not score for seven races in succession before a point in Britain, then that 1-2 finish at Paul Ricard. There was tension between the drivers, which developed into more or less open feuding after Arnoux didn't let Prost by on that occasion, but it probably didn't affect much given that they broke down more often than not. The rumours of corporate pulling the plug have subsided somewhat after a better latter half of the season, though many are interpreting Lotus's engine deal as a sign that at the very least the bosses are exploring other alternatives. Things look good for March on paper, with a reliable car, a tidy sponsorship deal, and an experienced race-winning driver in Jochen Mass, but once again things didn't work out that way. The baffling decision to run a third car for De Viotta didn't help, and the team appeared to have made another mistake by buying up all the remaining stock of Avon tyres after they pulled out, rather than finding a new supplier. Mass did as well as he could, but became increasingly disenchanted and disengaged, concentrating more on his sports car duties, while Bozell was usually the slower of the two, and, he suspect, had the thin end of whatever meagre resources were available. Another team struggling financially, the Brazilians might be looking wistfully at their old boy Keke's season, but just reaching Caesar's palace amid persistent rumours that the team was on the brink of folding was an achievement. Serra is no Emerson Fittipaldi reborn, but he's a capable driver who will reliably bring the car home, and was rewarded with a point in Belgium. It's not much, but at this level a point is as good as a win. Will we see them back in 1983? And if not, with a Serra. Like Renault, persistent rumours that a disappointed corporate HQ is about to turn off the money tap, but unlike Renault, they don't have four wins and third in the table to show for their efforts. The car's quick, the engine's powerful, and they usually qualified well, but had real trouble finishing. If it weren't for the rather fluky third place in Monaco, achieved after de Cesaris had already gotten out of his broken-down car, they would have ended the season on three points, the same as Azella. Andrea de Cesaris, on the other hand, has been one of the most improved drivers of the year, and most of his retirements, though not all, were mechanical failure rather than driver error. Bruno Giacomelli, on the other hand, often didn't seem to be trying at all, perhaps disenchanted with the team, or perhaps just a bit too laid back in attitude. Oof. After title tilts in 1980 and 81, this year has been a real come down for the French team. The season saw the team perpetually mired in politics, with factions developing and the precise nature of the Talbot conglomerate's involvement still unclear. The continued non-appearance of Matra's promised 1.5-litre turbo, which the JS19 chassis was designed around, didn't help, and now it seems that instead of finishing it, they're going to pull out of F1 entirely. Lafitte, Mr. Ligier to many people, seemed thoroughly dispirited by the whole affair, and so, on the rare occasion that the car went well, it was usually Cheever who took advantage. Both are on their way to pastures new, though, with Williams and Renault respectively, and it remains to be seen who will be driving next year. To lose one star driver in a terrible accident may be regarded as a misfortune. To lose two begins to look like a problem with your chassis. Many had tipped this to be Ferrari's year, and most pundits agree that Didier Peroni should have been champion this year and would have been without his accident. Certainly, to win the Constructors' title while running much of the season with only one car is no mean feat, and the inspired signing of Patrick Tombe helped no end. He scored in every race he finished bar one, three out of five of them on the podium, and generally looked like he'd slotted straight in. Ferrari have never been overly sentimental about drivers, though. Enzo continues to promise a third car for Peroni in 1983 whenever he wants it. No driver is yet announced to partner Arno for the full season, but most expect Tombe to be kept on, unless those rumours about Michele Alboreto turn out to be true. It was a bit of a difference from pole at race one in 1981 to double DNQ at the first race in 1982, but things picked up with the arrival from injury of Mark Sura, who only failed to finish three times during the year. The car may not have been particularly fast, but it was reliable, and both Sura and Baldi scored twice by dint of simply keeping it on the road. The new car introduced in the closing stages to be ready for 1983 looked good in Sura's hands too, so Jackie Oliver's boys can be cautiously optimistic about next year. Another dreadful year for the Italian privateers, once again losing a team member to a tragic accident. Even before that, though, Paletti was very much playing second fiddle to Jarier and not getting the support he needed. 
That they didn't replace him is probably more a testament to that fact than any sentimental reason. Jarier himself, on the other hand, seemed to lose interest very quickly once the car's limitations became obvious. Interestingly, his brief bursts of form always seemed to coincide with another team, Williams or Ferrari, looking for a new driver. Things started well enough for Teddy Yip's little team, with Derek Daly qualifying for every race before being poached by Williams. After that, though, a distinctly underwhelming Lammers and an unpopular and inexperienced Byrne had much more difficulty. In fact, Derek Daly's 14th place in South Africa was the only time the car saw the chequered flag all year. Teddy Yip has been in the motor racing game for many years now, and he knows the score. Whether he will decide to cut his losses or continue putting money in and hope for the better, we will see. An improvement on last year for sure, and the new car for next year looks very promising. The team still haven't scored points, but at least they're finishing more or less reliably now. Obviously, there is still talk about what happened at Brands Hatch. The rest of the season's results didn't seem to give any indication that they were capable of running second, and it's widely assumed that there was some trickery going on, but we'll never know exactly what. Of the two drivers, Warwick is clearly much more talented than the machinery is currently allowing him to show, while Farby struggled with an increasing lack of attention and resources as the season went on. <laughs>